We're in Titus chapter 1, verses 10 to 16. We're just working our way through Titus over a number of weeks. And we'll have a break next week with Reformation Sunday as we spend time thinking uh, about Martin Luther and God's word. But today we're looking at Titus chapter 1, verses 10 to 16. For there are also many rebellious people, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those from Judaism. It's necessary to silence them. They overthrow whole households by teaching for dishonest gain what they should not. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. So rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commandments of men who reject the truth. To the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and disqualified for any good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, keep your Bibles open there. Uh, If you've got a bulletin and newsletter, you'll have an outline there on the inside cover on the left-hand side, up the top on the right-hand side. Uh, You've got some household questions to help you talk about this at the dinner table, lunch table, morning tea later on. Uh, There are Bible studies up the back that you could be using during the week. And please remember the memory verse, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Some people have reminded me that you looked at Titus uh, with Tim uh, a couple of years ago, and so some of you have got a head start with the memory verse because it's exactly the same one. Uh, But let me encourage you to spend some time with that. Not easy, uh, but worth doing just to get God's word embedded into your minds and hearts. Well, we love the Little House on the Prairie series, the books, not the TV show, okay? The books, not the TV show. We're reading through them for the umpteenth time as a family. If you want to borrow them, please come and chat to me later on. Uh, we're in the uh, in the fourth book, but the third book is the one that names the series, Little House series, Little House on the Prairie. And there is a, a scene in that book that I think is just wonderful. Uh, if you've got a good imagination. Uh, Pa, the father of the family, has just returned from an exploration and he's in a fluster. Uh, He's bolted back on his horse because whilst he was out riding, he was surrounded by a large pack of prairie wolves, so big that while he was on his horse, their heads reached his knee and they ran with him as he rode and all he could do was ride with them. Because he'd been out exploring during the day, he hadn't taken his gun with him. And the wolves just ran with him. They were too immense to outrun, and he and his horse were too scared. But as soon as the wolves moved off, he headed for home as fast as he could because he was scared for his household. Uh, That night, as the family goes to bed in their log cabin, which Pa has just built, a log cabin with no glass on the windows and no door in the doorway, the wolves surround the whole house. And they sit in an immense circle around the house and they just sit there under the full moon. And they sit and they watch. And then every now and again, the leader of the pack howls and they all howl together. Can you imagine it? And Pa stands at the door and he watches and he guards. He's got one gun, a barrel-loaded gun with one shot, but he stays up all night. He moves from door to window to door to window to door to window and the trusty dog Jack watches and guards with him. He's protecting his household, isn't he? And there's this marvellously tender scene when Laura wakes up, his middle child, who writes the series, and she pads over to Pa, and Pa picks her up and shows her the wolves. And she's scared, but she knows that Pa is there all night, watching. 
guard him with the only thing he has. There are wolves at the door. Can you imagine that? Just a blanket in the doorway. There are wolves at the door and Pa protects his household. We heard a bit of that image last week, didn't we? With that imagery from Acts 20 that Brian brought us as Paul stands there and he farewells the elders leading the Ephesian church. Remember that reading? As he talked to them, he reminded them of their job. You've got to feed the sheep and shoot the wolves. That's your job. And you've got one thing to do it with, the truth about Jesus Christ, the grace of God. And at the end of the section we looked at last week, we had a hint that such a situation was emerging there where Titus was in Crete. Look there in verse 9 if you've got your Bibles. Uh, This is the type of elder to a point, holding to the faithful messages taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. The elders have a job. Feed the sheep, shoot the wolves. There is danger. There are wolves at the door, if not already in the door. And the elders appointed must protect the household by feeding the sheep, shooting the wolves with the only tool they have, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. And we're going to spend some time looking at the wolves today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks that we can open it and read it. And there aren't wolves at the door literally at the moment. Thank you for the great comfort we enjoy. Father, as we've prayed for the Applebee's and as we've remembered our brothers and sisters in Southeast Asia, we give thanks to you for the comfort you give us. And we pray that you'll protect us from apathy. We pray that you'll protect us from wolves. We pray that we will know the truth that leads to knowing you and showing you to the universe. Amen. Well, Titus, remember, it's a small private letter. Remember Ben and Rocket two weeks ago, small private letter from Paul to Titus, uh, written somewhere, as we learned last week, in the early to mid-60s AD. Paul has left Titus in Crete. He's got to get things organised in the church and appoint elders right throughout the cities there in Crete. And what was the key to appointing an elder? Was it charisma? Was it cash? Was it courage? Was it cunning? Was it cleverness? No, it was character, wasn't it? was character, and it was character proven in their own households because they were then to be appointed to lead God's household, feeding that household with the message of the news of Jesus Christ so that the household could show God to the world, showing that life is bigger than just breathing and eating and surviving. Those elders share Paul's own mission and message. Remember his mission? For the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. To get the truth about Jesus out there so people know God and are changed to represent him. Remember that truth from 1 Corinthians 15? Jesus died, was buried, rose for our sins according to God's word. And that truth had seized Paul. And completely changed him. He's been commanded, commissioned, he is devoted to proclaim that truth to the whole world, to practice it so that God's people can show God to the world. And the elders stand in that line of authority. And part of that commission, you'll notice how verse 10 starts? Four. Part of that commission is to handle God's word well because there's a danger, an alternative truth out there. And we're meant to see the connections between choosing an elder and their qualities of character and what they're about to do. Let me just show you some of them. Notice in verse 6, the elder is to be proven by dealing with rebellion at home. That's so in verse 10, he can deal with rebellion in God's household. Same word. Notice there in verse 7, The elder has oversight of his own household and God's household so that he can help households in verse 11 that have been completely overthrown. Same word for household. Notice there in verse 9, the elder has a proven track record of sound teaching. So he will be able to use that sound teaching to bring the wolves back to soundness in their faith. The same word for sound. So the elder is proven not just as a feeder of God's household, but as a protector 
of God's household. Now, the danger that Pa faced on that night, the danger that Pa faced on that night out on that windswept prairie, the danger was pretty clear and present, wasn't it? Just had to look out the window and to see a full circle of wolves around your little log cabin. The danger here is just as clear and present. Look at verse 10. For there are also many rebellious people, idle talkers and deceivers, especially those from Judaism. It's necessary to silence them. They overthrow whole households by teaching for dishonest gain what they should not. I'm at point two on the outline. The wolves, they're easy to identify. They've come with dangerous words, rebellious words, deceptive words, idle words. I'd pick up that imagery, they fire from the hip so that they deceive from the heart. They fire from the hip so that they deceive from the heart. They're like a massive circle around the household and they're starting to break in. And Paul identifies them even more specifically there in verse 10. Did you see that? Especially those from Judaism. Paul's issue isn't with the Old Testament at this point. His issue is with how people have used the Old Testament. So what does he mean by that, especially those from Judaism? Well, we know if we read our Bibles that in Acts chapter 2, verse 11, on that first great evangelistic sermon in Jerusalem, there were Jews from Crete there listening to Peter. They heard the truth about Jesus and went back and the church was started, but some of them have mixed what they know from the Old Testament with Jesus and have added a whole nother layer. If you want it, it's Jesus plus. Jesus isn't enough. There's an evil world out there. Jesus isn't enough to beat it, so we've got to add a whole lot of rules and regulations in to keep that world at bay. We get a bit more of a hint there in verse 14. They're mixing it up if you look at verse 14 with myths and commandments and they're peddling it. And not only are they peddling it, they're making a profit from it. And then we get even more hints in verses 15 to 16 where Paul jumps in to talk about purity and impurity. So the picture seems to be this. Jesus isn't enough. He's gone. We want to help you deal with that evil world out there So we're going to add on some rules and regulations so that you're protected and that evil is kept out there. They've added stuff to Jesus and in doing so, they've diluted Jesus. Why would they do that? Well, we're given a number of reasons, aren't we? Uh, Verse 11, they're motivated by their bank balance. If you can sell something innovative, you can charge for it, can't you? Isn't that the way the world works? <laughs> We've got something new for you. You're deficient. Jesus isn't enough. If you give us the dollars, we'll give you the correct stuff. So they're motivated by their bank account. Second, they're offering something that they say will deal with the world out there. That's the stuff in verses 15 to 16. They're playing on people's fears, aren't they? Look at how evil the world is. Jesus isn't here. It's just a message on a page. I need to do something to keep that world at bay. And thirdly, they're offering something that's dangerous. I don't think this is a motivation. This is more an effect, isn't it? Look there in verse 11. It's overthrowing whole households. It's decimating God's mob by overthrowing each of the households in God's household. It's destructive and it's got to be stopped. It's worth pausing there and thinking about what's being threatened. After all, it's only just words, isn't it? And we know that words aren't going to really hurt you, are they? We deal with words every day, don't we? That white noise out there. What's so threatening about these words that calls for such a sharp response? I think we've got to remember Paul's concern. He's got a really deep concern for God's household, isn't it? Remember that last week? The elder is to care for God's mob. That's that's the elder's primary concern. Paul is deeply concerned for God's mob wherever they are. And so when he sees God's mob being mucked up, 
by being taken away, you've got to do something about it. Paul's deep concern is that God's mob holds on to God's truth. Remember Paul's experience on that road to Damascus? God reached down and grabbed him and said, meet Jesus who's alive. It completely changed him. It created God's household. It's a truth that shows how big life is, that life is more than just breathing and struggling. Life is about eternity. Remember that? That Jesus was dead and buried and rose for your sins according to God's word. It's a truth that sees us broken and says, God will fix you. It's a truth that says God will do everything for you. He will deal with your sin. He will restore your nature. He will give you a vision through death. It's a truth that is consistent and clear, not hidden and obscure. At the heart of that is Paul's deep concern for grace. I want you to notice that word hasn't appeared in the letter, has it? Where does it first appear in the letter? If you're learning your memory verses, you'll know, won't you? Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared. We don't get it till there in chapter, but everywhere Paul's quill is working, grace is seeping out on the page. Grace is God's kindness to those who deserve his judgment. God's undeserved kindness. If you want a definition of grace, read Acts 9. Paul off to Damascus to kill Christians. Someone who's so far from God who hates Jesus that he wants to kill the followers of Jesus. And God reaches down and says, I'm going to give you what you don't deserve, Paul. I'm going to grab you. I'm going to forgive you because Jesus lived, died and rose for you. No amount of Paul's goodness, his good deeds, his religious observance, his religious fervour, his attendance at the synagogue, his memorization of the scriptures, none of that allowed him to deserve that event. He had an appearance of someone who knew God, but he was a killer, a murderer. That's what grace is, isn't it? God taking a sinner and saying, Jesus has lived, died, and risen for you. You do not deserve it, but I will shower you with it. Paul is concerned for grace, and Paul is concerned for that household, that it hold on to the truth, that it be transformed by grace, and that's all being threatened by people who shoot from the hip and deceived from the heart. Those wolves with their words threatening God's household by overturning each household. They offer more than Jesus. Jesus is not enough. God's grace is not enough. We need to add more to have life. The world is evil, so invasive that we need to do stuff more than what Jesus did. And that's what they're peddling. And it's got to be stopped. So how are you going to stop it, Paul? How are you going to stop it, Titus? Elders, what are you going to do about it? Well, Pa had a very clear course of action, didn't he, in that cabin? (laughs) What was his course of action? Grab the weapon and stay vigilant. All night for his household. It's similar here, a very clear course of action. Point three on the outline. First is recognise the nature of the teaching. We've already done a bit of that, haven't we? It's a teaching that destroys by addition. It says Jesus is not enough, you got to do more. Now, the additions aren't explicit here, but they seem to be stuff like commands and rituals and regulations that you got to add on to Jesus, stuff we do. But you can recognise it even further by seeing how it comes out of the culture you live in. Did you see that in verse 12? Look at verse 12. One of their own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. That's actually a line from a Cretan philosopher. He recognised the culture he lived in. And when you look at that, that kind of culture produces this kind of false teaching. It's a false teaching that's deceptive. It's destructive like evil beasts. And it's bone lazy because it offers a lie and then charges money for it. 
That's always the way with culture, the culture we live in. Our wider culture is the soil that grows false teaching. Our wider culture is the soil that grows false teaching. And we're going to come to that at the application. Uh, The second step, once you've recognised the false teaching, is to respond swiftly, clearly and with care. That's what Pa did. He grabbed the gun, he didn't muck about and he was ready. He identified the danger and he dealt with it. Well, the false teaching must be silenced. Look there in verse 11. It's necessary, imperative, unavoidable. It is necessary to silence them. Carrying that wolf imagery further, whack a muzzle on them. Stop them talking. No airplay, no pulpit, no platform in God's household. The false teaching must be refuted. Look there in verse 9. To refute those who contradict it. In those days it would have been within the church gathering or in conversation. In our day online, well, it's, this is a really applicable option, isn't it? Refuting. Because there is so much that's accessible out there. False teaching is accessible with the click of a button. Anywhere in the world. And the elder, the leader of God's household, must be aware of that stuff so that they can speak to it as they handle God's word. And the false teachers must be rebuked. Look there in verse 13. So rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commandments of men who reject the truth. Uh, Confrontation's a necessity. Pa knew that in the prayer, he didn't. He couldn't just chat to the wolves and click his fingers and pat them on the head. He had to confront them to protect his household. But I want you to notice why it's done. Did you see that there in verse 13? Did you see it there in verse 13? Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Now, I love that snappy phrase, feed the sheep and shoot the wolves. I reckon I'm going to patent that one. But it kind of falls down here because we don't shoot the wolves to destroy them, do we? We shoot the wolves to resurrect them, to restore them. False teachers are people who need to know Jesus, who need to be restored in their brokenness, to come back into the community as sheep, not wolves in sheep's clothing. That's why they need to be confronted, because the same grace that builds God's God's household is for the wolves as well so that they can be restored. And did you notice that right through that, right through those methods is the same tool, God's word? Did you notice that? That's why you've got to pick elders who have shown their ability to handle it. It's the simple truth that Jesus died, was buried and rose for our sins according to the scriptures. And the final step in dealing with the wolves, recognise the big picture. Look at verse 15. To the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing's pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, and disqualified for any good work. Now, let me say there's been a lot of ink spilled on these two verses. And I'm not going to give you a clear, definitive answer today. (laughs) But I think they're at least saying this. Get the big picture. To the pure... Everything is pure. The pure are those who hold on to the truth about Jesus. And once Jesus has grabbed them in God's undeserved mercy, they then are transformed and know how the world works. They can navigate the world God's way. They have all they need in Jesus. But the impure, those who've turned away from the truth, those who haven't even come to know the truth, those who have been grabbed by false teaching, They don't see the world properly. If you like, they look at the world through cracked glasses, warped and damaged, because they look at the world through themselves, not through God who made life. And if you want to recognise them, just try and match what they say with what they do. That's what verse 16 is about, isn't it? They say they know God, but look at how they live. 
They proclaim Jesus, but look what they practice. They offer the truth, but look at the lies they live. Their practice undermines their proclamation. No wonder Paul wants them to be brought to know the truth so that they can be sound. Well, I'm at the last point on the outline. Uh, if you want a copy of that little scene from Little House on the Prairie, I'll photocopy it for you. It's worth reading. Uh, in, in that little house on that vast American prairie, Pa protected his household from the wolves with the only tool he had. In the vast prairie of human history, the elder is given the job of protecting the household of God from the wolves with the only tool they have. They've got to be dealt with. And I want to close with some very brief observations about what that looks like. Firstly, you'll see them there on your outline, or if they're not there, jot them down. First, remember this is for all of us. Remember we said that because of the last phrase where Paul goes to the pl plural, grace be with all of you. This letter is for all of us. Please don't minimise the threat of wolves and don't be alarmist. <laughs> there are wolves out there. There is false teaching that will say Jesus isn't enough. As God's household, we must weigh everything we see, hear or speak against that truth. Does this podcast, does this website, does this online sermon, does what has been preached from the lectern at 13 Dewhurst Street, does it match the truth? Or does it say Jesus is not enough? And there's a very simple measuring tool, isn't there? What is it? It's the Bible. That offers Jesus alone. Secondly, the elders of God's household have a very clear job description. Deal with the wolves. And let me tell you, they've been given all that they need to do that. If you like, the word of God is the shoots of grass to feed the sheep and the shotgun that shoots the wolves. It does both. And so let me encourage you to encourage your elders to do that. It's as simple as opening God's word so that sheep are fed and wolves are dealt with. It doesn't need verbal violence. It doesn't need vitriol or sarcasm. It doesn't need witty posts online or verbal aggression. It just needs this. Jesus is enough. Jesus died, was buried and rose for our sins according to the scriptures. That'll make the sheep fat and sleek in God's word and it will keep the wolves away. Thirdly, Jesus is not enough. Now let me be very clear. In my time as an elder, for want of a better word, I have not confronted this in the form that Paul talks about it in this church or in any other church I've been connected with. But that doesn't mean that our culture around us doesn't encourage us to think falsely. <laughs> Jesus is not enough. That's what our culture will say to us. You mean that's all you need for life? Jesus? What about opportunity? What about holidays? What about success? What about a legacy? What about not missing out? Jesus is enough? Our world will look at that and scoff. And so it will then invade God's household and it will cultivate an idea that Jesus isn't enough and perhaps we are missing out. Perhaps I've missed an opportunity. Perhaps my children have missed an opportunity. Perhaps my family's missed an opportunity. Please be aware of that because I want to say very clearly here, Jesus is enough. He is all you need for life in eternity. He is all you need. 
And we must hold on to that, mustn't we? That Jesus died and was buried, rose for our sins according to the Scriptures, for us, for our children, and for our households. Finally, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness will transform you. Paul has said that right from the beginning. It's displayed in his life and he desires it to be displayed in the household of God. And this section actually finishes on that point. Jesus is not enough will be seen in people's lives. Jesus is enough that will transform you. That will transform you. Deeds emerge from understanding the doctrine that Jesus is enough. We're going to turn to that in two weeks, but let me encourage you, please read ahead to chapter 2, not just to learn the memory verse, but to see the way this truth transforms. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word to us. Thanks for this truth that feeds us and keeps false teachers at bay. Father, please protect your household from wolves. Please equip the elders to proclaim that truth. Please help us to understand our culture so that we know the soil that gives rise to false teaching. And Father, please transform us by that truth so that we show you to the world. Amen.